Okay, let's talk about some important properties of life, how life is formed or built, and then we'll talk about the organ system. So some of the important themes of life are that everything biological has hierarchy. We're not made from nothing. We actually start as something, and we start as things like molecules. And the molecules add together, and they, they build organelles. Organelles build cells, and we just keep building upon that. So each level depends on the level below it to work properly. Uh, we refer to this also as having emergent properties. So the biological structure or the biological function of each of these different levels has to work. For instance, at the molecular level, if the molecules don't work, like if there's something wrong with um, uh, the molecule, molecule for metabolism, let's say you introduce cyanide to a cell, that molecule creates a problem and prevents everything else from, from working. If you don't have water, you can't have functions at, at higher levels. So I'm going to talk a little bit about emergent properties on the next slide. When we talk about the cells, the cells are the basic structure and functional unit of life. Without cells, nothing else works. Anything smaller than a cell is not technically alive, and we'll get into that in better detail later. But the cells are the basic functional units of life. Everything in your body depends on organization of the cells, how they're put together. Are they organized correctly? If they're not put together appropriately and they don't function appropriately, the organs and the whole body will shut down. And your body is not this static or stagnant thing that doesn't change. You're dynamic. You're constantly changing. So how you maintain life depends on your ability to change. If your body gets too hot, you need to find a way to cool down. If it gets too cold, you need to find a way to warm up. You have to constantly maintain these things, whether you're maintaining nutrients or oxygen and gas, acid base balance, you're constantly in this um, dynamic flux. You're moving back and forth. Nothing's perfect and that dynamic balance is called homeostasis or maintenance of your internal environment. And we'll talk about that later in better detail too. So going back to the idea of everything's hierarchical. Everything depends on the functioning of the smaller components of the body down to the molecular level. If I introduce toxins to your body, it's going to start shutting your cells down, which will shut your tissues down, your, your organs down. So we're going to actually break everything down and look at it at a molecular level, well, not so much a molecular, but a cellular level first, and then we'll keep building up until we get to the whole systems, and then we'll go through all of the systems through the semester. When you uh, break things down from large to small parts, so for instance, when you're looking at a system and you break it down to each individual cell, it's called reductionism. When you look at how each of these parts work and you look at how it helps or gives structure to the next part, we call these emergent properties. Okay? So we're going to try and understand the whole organism, how it works. We'll look at chemicals, we'll look at the molecules, we'll look at how they form organelles. Organelles are just like little tiny organs inside of your body, but they're inside of a, a cell. We'll see how all the organelles work together to form a cell and make the cell have life. Remember the cell is the basic function of life. We'll see how different types of cells work together to form a tissue. We'll talk about the types of tissue. We'll see how different types of tissues form organs. We'll talk about all the different organs. We'll see how different organs that work together form an organ system, like the digestive tract. We'll see how the different organ systems work together, like the digestive tract, which the cardiovascular and nervous system, to form an organism. And we'll see that all of these things are dependent on each other. You can't have just um, you know, one organ system and have complete life sustainable. At the same time, you can't have a whole organism and just miss one system. Just imagine what would happen to you if you had no digestive tract. What would happen to you if you had no brain? You know, your heart could beat on its own without the brain, but as soon as the brain stops um, telling the lungs to pump oxygen, then your heart's going to fail. So we'll talk about some of the dependency of these different levels as we get through here. Right, that idea of emergent properties, everything that we're going to talk about starts as atoms. And the atoms form biomolecules. And biomolecules, the primary ones, are going to be carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. So carbohydrates we usually think of as sugars, like glucose. Proteins are kind of like the Legos or the building blocks of the body. Um, they stick together and they form strong structures. Your bones are made of long chains of proteins that are basically cemented in with things like calcium and phosphate and magnesium. Lipids are there for energy storage. They're also there for padding. So we have all these different structures that are really important for life. Even inside one individual cell, you have things like glucose, you have proteins that give us a skeleton or structure to the cell, you have lipids in there um, to help keep the membrane fluid, 
and the nucleic acids are things like RNA and DNA that are holding the genetic code for life. So again, the emergent properties all start at atoms and biomolecules. When you start putting these atom and atoms and biomolecules together and you start building important things in the cell, you can build cytoskeletons. You can build organelles. Right? Organelles, like I said, are like little tiny organs in the cell. You have a, a little stomach-like structure in there. You have a little energy-producing plant in there. You have uh, vesicles that carry waste, to get excrete the wastes. You have uh, metabolic functions that are going on there. So you have all these little components of life. And we're going to talk about the organelles in a lot more detail when we get into the actual organelle chapter. But here are some general ideas. Here you have this you know, generic cell, this blob-like cell, and you can see all these little tools, these organs, that are inside of it. Right? And we'll talk a lot better in detail about these later. The organelles are what give the, the cell life. They do the same thing as your organs in your body. They have properties that keep the cell alive. The cell itself, kind of the key is it's the basic functional unit of life. Life depends on the cell. Uh, anything smaller than a cell, like an organelle, is not technically alive. It's just there to help sustain life. So all living organisms are composed of at least one cell or more. Like a bacteria in this example, here you can see the bacteria, that's one cell. They don't have to stick together, there's one by itself and it can stay alive for a long time. Here's a white blood cell that's actually eating up the bacteria. The white blood cell has a very difficult time living on its own outside of body. But we'll talk about the dependency of the different cells in your body soon. All right. Cells are classified by different components that, that they have or different features they have. In fact, two major categories of cells are cells called eukaryotes, which make you, your form of eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotes have a distinguishing feature that's called the nucleus. Okay? Eukaryote means that it's well nutted or it has this nut-like structure inside of it, and that's what the nucleus is. Uh, very different are prokaryotes, and they don't have a nucleus. They don't have that structure on the inside. Their DNA is arranged differently than our DNA, DNA is arranged. So we'll talk about the different major components of our cells, like the eukaryotes. We'll talk about the plasma membrane or the outer layer. We'll talk about the nucleus that stores your genetic code. We'll talk about the cytoplasm. And we'll talk about terminology like we did in the last video. Cyto meaning cellular. Plasma meaning it's a plasma or fluidy like substance with particles in it. So all this fluidy like substance in here with the particles is the cytoplasm. And then we'll talk about the specific organelles. Right? Prokaryotes are unique be, you know, compared to eukaryotes because they don't have that real nucleus and they also don't have any real organelles. What's interesting is that this isn't a, a perfect size comparison. If you look, this bacterial cell is about the same size as the mitochondria, one of the organelles. And what they think is that the mitochondria was originally a bacteria that your cell ate and said, hey, this is really good at producing energy. I'm going to use this. So develop this symbiotic relationship or this mutual relationship where this bacterial cell is benefiting from being protected by the outer cell, and this outer cell is benefiting because it's getting lots and lots of energy from this bacteria. And we'll talk about that in better. Right. So cell life has definitions. When you look at cell life, cell life is just like life for you. Cells are composed of living things. You're composed of living things. Right? All living things are composed of cells. Um, there are different levels of organization we've been talking about. Cells have to use energy. We have to use energy. We respond to our environment. We sense our environment. Cells do the same thing. We'll talk about how these work. What's interesting about the cell is that when you look at the cell, it's a mini you. It grows, it eats, it produces waste products, it reproduces, it replicates, it changes the environment, senses the environment. It, it breathes just like you. It breathes in oxygen, it makes energy, and breathes out CO2. So we'll talk about these again in more detail, but these are the basic functions of life that really give the, the cell definition. And here's some examples of cells over here. Right? Cells differentiate. Even though the generic cell in your body has certain organelles in it, specific organelles, the proportions are different depending on their needs. Like we'll talk about mitochondria producing energy and we'll talk about some cells in the body that have more mitochondria than average because obviously they make more energy. We'll talk about um, organelles like the rough endoplasmic reticulum that makes proteins and cells in your body that are making lots and lots of proteins will have lots of this rough endoplasmic reticulum. Like white blood cells that make tons of protein antibodies, they have lots of rough endoplasmic reticulum. Or organs in your body that detoxify things are specialized because they have organelles that break substances down. Of course, that would be the liver that has lots of these, these organelles like peroxisomes that break apart um, toxins and invaders. Right. 
you have a hundred trillion cells in your body. What's interesting is that not all of those are human cells. Like in your your digestive tract, you have a lot of bacterial cells, and there are about two hundred different types of cells in the body, and we have one semester to cover almost all of those. So we're gonna go through them one step at a time. You're gonna do a lot of drawings. You're gonna look at a lot of things under a microscope as we progress through here. And again, each of these cells, when it differentiates, has a special purpose. Like everything starts from a sperm and an egg. So the sperm and the egg form this digote. It starts developing, forming layers. It starts developing even more, form different tissues in your body. And you see lots of these different tissues and cells that are happening because these original cells differentiated. They became functional for a specific purpose, like a neuron developed for electrical communication, a muscle cell developed for contraction, an uh, epithelial cell developed for protective covering. And I already kind of jumped into this, but these groups of cells that have common functions can form tissues. And there are four primary tissues you have to know. And the first one's epithelium. When you see epithelium, you want to think protective sheet-like covering. So wherever you see epithelium, it forms a sheet, a long, flat sheet. Like your skin is a really good example. There's no breaks. There's no cuts. Your skin comes all the way over the surface of your body. It folds in, goes down into your mouth, your esophagus, into your stomach, your small intestine, large intestine, out the anus, and right continuous with the skin again. There's no breaks. That's a continuous sheet of epithelium. It's a tissue. Uh, I'm going to skip over connective tissues and go straight to muscle. Muscle is there for contraction primarily. It's for moving things. We're, we'll talk about the different types of muscle, like cardiac muscle obviously is there for moving blood, it's pumping blood. Uh, smooth muscle, like that lines your GI tract, is there for moving food or propelling food through your digestive system. And when we talk about skeletal muscle, obviously that's going to be your skeleton, so for moving and contracting. When you look at nervous tissue, nervous tissue's primary function is for electrical communication over long distances. So it'll send signals from your brain down your spinal cord and out to your fingers, your toes, everywhere to try and move things. It's a long distance communication. The longest cell in the body is actually a neuron and it's about three feet long. It goes from your sacrum, the tip of your, your uh, spinal column, all the way down to the tip of your toe, about three feet. And that's one cell. It sends electrical communication a long distance. And I covered these first, or these three first because this is very distinguished. Sheet-like areas, contraction and movement, electrical communication or long distance communication. These have very specific purposes. Connective tissue, I like to think of as other. So connective tissue can do lots of things. Like for instance, blood. Blood's not a sheet-like covering. Blood's not there for contraction. It's not there for long distance electrical communication. So it must be a connective tissue. Bone's not a sheet-like covering. Bone looks flat. It can, like the skull, it looks like a sheet kind of, but it actually ho has holes in it. So it's not true epithelium. Muscles, bone's not there to contract. The bone gives a framework or a structure. And then it's not for electrical communication, so bone is other. So it's connective tissue. And we'll talk about that. Fat would fall under connective tissue too. So those are the four primary types of tissues that we're going to talk more specifically about in the next unit or the next chapter. But you have to know these. So next, when you start looking at an organ, an organ is when two tissues come together, so maybe it's muscle and connective tissue, and they start having one specific purpose. Like for instance, when you look at a muscle in your body, not a muscle tissue, but an actual muscle organ. The muscle organ needs blood supply. Remember, blood's connective tissue. The muscle organ has a wrap around it, epithelial tissue. When you look at the actual contractile fibers in there, that's muscle tissue. And then nervous tissue tells the skeletal muscle what to do. Your brain tells it what to do. So this actually has all four tissues for one function to move this bone. So that's an organ made of more than two or two more tissues with one common goal. Okay, so some other structures, organ systems, when you take a bunch of organs and put them together for one purpose, they form an organ system. Right? So there are 11 of these in the human body. Some books refer to them as 12 because when you look at the reproductive system, you have the male reproductive and the female, which is uh, very much the same, but also very much different. So 11 or 12 of these systems in the body. When you look at organs, one organ can't work by itself. So just think of the stomach. Here you have a stomach, and the stomach's made of smooth muscle, epithelial tissue, connective tissue, nervous tissue, lots of different tissues with one common goal. But that stomach doesn't work by itself. It needs the mouth to chew and grind up food to put it down in there. It needs the esophagus to transport uh, down into the stomach. It needs the small intestine to absorb nutrients. 
and these little large intestine reabsorb things like water. So all of those organs work together as one common goal, and that's to digest and absorb food. That's one system. Right? When you start putting all these systems together, and I already gave the example of the stomach, when you put the systems together, you have an organism. The GI tract doesn't rely on itself. It needs blood to keep it alive. It needs oxygen to keep it alive. It needs um, electrical activity to, to help move things and control things. It needs that contraction. So here are the different organ systems. And like I said, there are 11 or possibly 12 if you go ahead and say that male and female are separate. And we're going to go through each of these this semester one at a time. And just by looking at these, you can kind of predict what they're going to be. Like here's the superficial surface of the body. Of course, that's going to be Skinner and the integument system. And what would this be? Well, that'd be the muscular system. How about this one? Skeletal. Here you have the brain and all of its wiring, nervous system. Here you have glands all over the place that release hormones. That would be the endocrine system. Here you have the heart and all of the blood vessels. That would be cardiovascular. Here you have lymphatics that carry the immune structures, so immune system. Here you have the lungs, that would be respiratory system. Here you have the stomach, the liver, the pancreas, you have the mouth swallowing food. That would be the alimentary canal or the digestive tract. Here you have kidneys and a bladder, urinary, and then you have the reproductive structure. So here you have the uterus and the ovaries, and here you have the testes and the penis. We'll go through each of them one at a time. So the first one, the muscular system, over 600 muscles in the body. And we'll even talk about some that are unique that not everybody has some muscles. Uh, we'll talk about the purposes. So the main function of the muscular system is to move you, locomotion. It's to help manipulate the environment, to gather food, hunt food, um, attack food. It helps you stand upright, maintain your posture. And also, uh, one that a lot of people don't think about is thermogenesis. If you're cold, what does thermogenesis mean? It means creation of thermo heat. You start shivering when you're cold. You start creating heat. So that's one thing a lot of people don't think about. The skeletal system gives you structure. The skeletal system is not there for, for moving the body. It's actually there for like a scaffolding underneath the muscles that are moving the body. And we'll talk about all 206 bones of the body. And that's one of the first uh, systems we're going to jump into. It's there for protection. Uh, it's not a sheet-like coupling like epithelium. It's there actually to give you structure, to give you a framework, to help protect the organs on the inside. Like, of course, what organ is going to be protected by this flat skull up here? the brain. How about through the vertebra, the spinal cord? What do you think the ribs are there to protect? Well, the ribs are going to protect the lung, the heart, right? And even the hips, the way the hips are designed to protect internal structures in the abdomen. And we'll talk about each of these. Something a lot of people don't think about is it also carries out a process called hemopoiesis. So this is referring to the blood, and it's actually the creation of blood. You make red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets in the skeletal system, and a lot of people don't think about that. You think blood, you think cardiovascular, but you have to start thinking skeletal system. And then, of course, it's a great storage site for minerals. 99% of all the calcium in the body is stored in the bone, so almost all of it's there. And of course, how do you get that calcium? You drink it, it goes into your GI tract, it goes into your blood, your blood transports it to the bone, and then you stick it onto the bone nervous system. This is a powerful control of the whole body. So it's going to have the brain, the spinal cord, the peripheral nerves. It's fast. It's like electrical communication, almost like flipping a light switch and having the light come on instantaneously. When you want to twitch your finger, you do it instantaneously, just like that. Right? It helps you respond to your environment. It helps maintain the internal environment. If your body gets cold, your nervous system says, hey, these are the things you have to do to warm it up. If your body's too hot, your nervous system says, hey, this is what you have to do to cool it down. So the nervous system is one of the systems that controls all the other systems in the body. And we'll talk about that in a lot of detail. Another controller of all the other systems is the endocrine. When you compare those two systems, there's a huge difference. The nervous system is fast, rapid, precise. It's very well structured. You have the central area, the brain, and then you have all these wires that go out, neurons and nerves that go out to specific areas to do direct control. But the endocrine system Almost every organ in your body is an endocrine gland, which means it can release hormones. Your brain releases hormones. Your heart releases hormones. A lot of these organs have other purposes, but they also release hormones, so they're endocrine. The endocrine system is spread out all over the body. It's kind of hit and miss where things are at. Okay? 
Here you can see some of the primary organs that are involved in the endocrine system. We're going to talk about this in detail. Compared to the nervous system that's fast, the endocrine system is slow to control things. In fact, it can take 50 years for the endocrine system to um, go from turning on to turning off when you think of something like menopause. Right? So during puberty, uh, the endocrine system takes on reproductive functions, and then at menopause, it starts shutting them down. But long-term control of the body, different special phases of development, uh, reproduction, right, puberty. Cardiovascular, of course, we're going to think about the heart, but it's cardio and vascular, so you need to think of blood vessels, too. Arteries, veins, capillaries, uh, venules, arterioles, things that maybe you haven't even heard of before, but they're all blood vessels. And then, of course, the major pump, the heart itself. And, of course, we know it pumps blood, but we also know that the, uh, the heart will release hormones because we just talked about it. It will release hormones that control uh, blood volume, which controls your blood pressure. It's great for transporting things, and a lot of people just think, well, it's transporting oxygen, but it's not. It's transporting sugars and proteins and amino acids that build proteins. It helps transport heat. If you put your feet in ice cold water, your arms start shivering. It's not because your arms are cold, it's because your feet are cold. The blood takes that heat from the arms, carries it down to the feet, and warms up the feet. So it's great for carrying things all over the body, and regulating the body. It's a very important center for homeostasis, actually. Right. And then integument system means skin. We'll talk about this in a, a lot of detail. We'll talk about the different structures in the skin. So we think of skin, but skin actually has a lot of components to it. It has accessory structures like nails and sweat glands and oil glands and cerumen glands, like which is earwax glands. Right? It's a protective covering. If you didn't have skin, your water would start evaporating really quick. Just think about a piece of meat. If you peel the skin off of a piece of chicken and leave it on the counter all day, it gets hard and crusty over the day because it gets dehydrated. You need your skin to hold water in. Your skin makes things like vitamin D when it's exposed to what? Sunlight, right? It makes vitamin D, a hormone, transports it through the body to help us retain calcium or absorb calcium. We'll talk about that in better detail later, right? Prevents you from losing heat, prevents you from losing water, helps keep bacteria and invaders like viruses out. And it's also a good sensory organ. We can close our eyes and plug your ears and you can still use your skin to feel where you are. You can find your way around the world. Right? Lymphatic or immune system, of course, it's to defend the body. It's the military for the body. It's all the different branches and we'll talk about how it's kind of like the Air Force and how it flies over the invader and dumps antibodies on it that attack the invader. We'll talk about how it's kind of like the Marines and like hand-to-hand -hand combat. Like for instance, down here in the bottom corner, there's a white blood cell chasing a bacteria. Look at it chase it. It's amazing. What do you think these things are? Those are red blood cells. And it's just pushing the red blood cells out of the way until it gets to that bacteria and engulfs it, eats it, and kills it. Right? The lymphatic system also collects loose liquids that get into your tissues. Like your blood leaks liquid into your, um, what we call the interstitial space, the space between the cells. The lymphatics collect that blood, bring it all the way back up to the heart, and dump it back into the blood. It gets rid of debris. Your lymphatics, you probably think of lymph nodes. So debris goes into the lymph nodes, the white blood cells in there attack it, kill it, process it, and help clean things up. So a really important system. Respiratory, of course, we're going to think of the lungs, but it's not just the lungs. It's the whole passageway to get oxygen in your body and carbon dioxide out of your body. It's good for other things, too. A lot of people don't think about it. But your lungs actually re regulate the acid-base levels in your body. If your body is too acidic, you start breathing heavier. <sighs> Blowing out carbon dioxide, which takes acids out with it. If your body is too basic, you want to keep those acids so the breathing will slow down. Right? So obviously we're going to think oxygen or CO2, but you also want to think help regulate pH or acidity. Digestive tract, the whole goal is to absorb nutrients, or actually intestinal. Nutri nutrients, digest them, break them down, and then absorb them. And here are all the structures, starting with the oral cavity in the mouth, going all the way down until you get out the anus and expel your waste products. So here you can see that pizza getting chewed up, turns into a little bolus of food, going down the esophagus and into the stomach to be processed. And then urinary system is to get excrete waste products or actually fluids from the body. It also helps regulate things like sodium, potassium, chloride things called electrolytes. It helps regulate your pH, which isn't in this slide, but um, just like the lungs, the kidney, if your body is too acidic, it will urinate out acidic urine to try and get rid of those acids. If it's too basic, it will get rid of bases to get rid of the um, base in your body. 
the Christ help, helping regulate weight class. And then the reproductive system, we usually talk about the last week because by then you're really comfortable with me and we can ask all kinds of interesting questions. Which All semester, I hope that when you have a chance to work with me, you ask questions. Be curious. I, I love talking about the body. If you come up with something you know interesting and, and new that I haven't thought about before, definitely point it out because uh, I want you to, to feel good about the questions you have and I really want you to look introspectively. Everything you're learning this semester is about you. So when we get to like the reproductive system, where did you come from? How did you develop? You didn't just come from nothing. So how does everything happen? I know that some people have kids and they don't really understand. I mean, they know how it happened, but they don't really understand what's going on inside their body while they're having the child. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we'll talk about sperm and, and the egg. I mean, you can see here's one egg and all these little tiny sperm around it. Here's another image of the egg and a little tiny sperm. Um, we'll dispel the myth of the stork raising the baby, of course. And we'll talk about all the structures, so in the male versus the female, and we'll talk about things like uh, the penis and the clitoris and how they're actually kind of the same organ, they've just developed differently um, during embryological development. So essentially they develop from the same thing and they just specialize depending on whether you're male or female. Right. So again, you should be able to list off the organs in each of those systems and the processes that are involved in each of those systems. And if you want some extra help, you can actually go to this innerbody.com, which I was playing with uh, earlier today, and it's, it's kind of a lot of fun. So you get to have some interactive play with the systems and get some learning down. So hopefully you got a lot of, out of this one. Now you can finish the exercises in your lab manual over the organ systems so that you're prepared for the quiz.